I'm Richard Gerhart, an intellectual property lawyer specializing in patents, trademarks, and copyrights. And I'm Elizabeth Gerhart, not an attorney, but I work at Gerhart Law doing the marketing, and I have my own startups. Welcome to Passage to Profit, the road to entrepreneurship, where we talk with small businesses, entrepreneurs, and discuss the intellectual property that helps them flourish. Today, we have a very special guest, a serial entrepreneur and business management consultant, Brian Will. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what he has to say about entrepreneurship. And then we have Taylor O'Neill with Richard's Rainwater. This is something that should have been done centuries ago, probably was a little in some one way <laughs> or another, but you are going to love this, everybody. And then we have Steve Graham with Valiant Coaching. And if you need personal help from a coach who really knows his stuff, you'll want to hear what Steve has to say. And who doesn't need personal help? So <laughs> I'm definitely down for that. I'm getting plenty of other <laughs> people. But before we get on to our distinguished guests, of course, it's time for IP in the news. And we have a kind of a special patent today. We found out that Alexa has a, the ability now to monitor sentiment well they well amazon applied for the patent we don't know that it actually does it yet well in theory though they know probably how, how to, to do, do it. it and so they'll be able to judge your emotional <laughs> stuff they'll know if you're happy or sad or somewhere or glad or somewhere in between Just all right i'm ordering more volume <laughs> 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 so I don't know, is this like a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, it's our, our tech overlords just keep taking more and more steps. And I think that this is just really the kind of the first step to being able to evaluate people uh, on a much larger scale and either advertise to them, but also maybe control their lives. You know, you've had too much to drink. You sound drunk, right? And that that's where all of this is eventually leading. You think so? I well, I'm convinced. Anyway, <laughs> we need to ask our guests. <laughs> if a computer told you to quit drinking, you'd quit drinking. <laughs> well, what if it called the police? You know, <laughs> you don't think you've been drinking at home. <laughs> anyway, Brian, you've been following this conversation. We hope. Uh, what do you think about uh, computers that can sense your emotion? The question is, what are they going to do with the information? And, and my example I will use is my daughter-in-law's name is Alexis. And whenever she's at the house and I call her, Alexa flips on. So what if you're married to an Alexis or Alexa and you guys get in an argument? It's going to detect a lot of emotion. And what's it going to do with that? So that's the scary part. Like you said a minute ago, is it going to call the police? Yeah, it's going to start serving uh, divorce lawyer ads or yeah. therapist ads, right? So I mean, what in the world are they going to do with that? What are they going to do with it? Well, that's just the problem. We don't know, right? We can laugh about it, but there may be more to but, it but than that. But you about serving the ads because like everything's kind of tied together now. So if I do something, we have Verizon, an ad will pop up on my computer or an ad will even pop up on the TV. And it's like, whoa, we were just talking about that. <laughs> my phone was listening. Right. <laughs> Surprisingly, I mean, a couple of times Elizabeth's phone got, has gone off in the kitchen saying what? And yeah. she's not even like, yeah, hooked up to Alexa. And it was so like, I, I, I can catch that. What did you say? <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty freaky. So Taylor, um, maybe you have some thoughts on this. My experience with Alexa is pretty limited. We only have one and it's in my two and a half year old daughter's room. She's decided that she loves Bad Bunny and that Justin Bieber's her boyfriend. So I pretty much just say, <laughs> hey, Alexa, play Bad Bunny or play Justin Bieber. And I'm usually pretty excited about it. So, um, you know. Right, right. so. Are, are Taylor, interesting, yeah. You're, you're going to get in trouble when she figures out she can order stuff from Amazon. <laughs> uh, no question, <laughs> you know. Justin Bieber no. dolls. Amazon, send me a new car, you know. Yeah, right. it's exactly. alarming how quickly she's picking up the cell phone, so I'm sure we're not far off from her understanding <laughs> Alexa. Steve, what are your thoughts? Well, I have several of the devices. I've been using them for, for several years and have kind of watched the evolution on how more intrusive they become because like you were talking about, I can be having a random discussion, asking about maybe a certain product and lo and behold, it'll pop up in the search field, how convenient. I, I, I like the ability to get instant information, but at what cost, 
what are they going to do with all the data mining? I think that's that's my perspective on it. I mean, where do we kind of close the door on it? Because it's integrated in a lot of cars now. A lot of cars come Alexa ready. I even saw a refrigerator. Why you would need an Alexa refrigerator? But it is. <laughs> that's a very but large it's, microphone. It's tied, it's tied right into their shopping. So, I mean, we know and probably directly to Whole Foods. So there you go. No, you're right, though. So I had this idea for a refrigerator a long time ago that would take an inventory and tell you what to cook and yeah. order the food that you needed to mm -hmm. round out your recipes. So they probably have the same idea, right? So they're going to look at your fridge and say, oh, you wanted to make meatloaf tonight. You don't have an onion. Here's an onion from Whole Foods. <laughs> exactly. It can scan it and then we can conveniently deliver it to you within this time frame. So, yeah. yeah. So, it, I mean, it, it does seem to have some positives, right? And um but the, the 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 point is is who is running this behind the scenes and what are their motives and what are their intentions and i think it's one thing to have uh you know commercial uh aspects to it but a lot of these companies are have active social agendas and i don't feel comfortable turning my my right. information over to a company that could use it for anything right sure. And this data is it's just, just the refrigerator company that gets it. It's everybody who gets it. Oh like, yeah. I have a we have a, a a robot that goes around and and supposedly vacuums up the floor. And they send the floor plan data, I found out, somewhere to somebody. Who needs a floor plan of my house? Wow, that's uh, interesting. Thieves yeah, that are going to exactly. come in and figure out where yeah, you would stash right. yeah. Go to thieves.com and you can get the floor plan of any house that you want to find run. out where Richard's safe is. <laughs> yeah. So and get his refrigerator. Kenya, right. opinion on this. Kenya, what do you think? Kenya, where, where are you on this? Well, the conspiracy theorist in me thinks it's a bit <laughs> intrusive, right? I mean, how much information are we willing to give up, right? Where we start to sacrifice our privacy and quality of life. So, although it's cool conceptually, it's a little scary that they're able to listen to us and, you know, take the tone of our voice or, tr you know, try to identify empathy in order to subscribe us something, right? And based on our needs. So it, it's it's a little scary. I, I don't know that I want to participate. <laughs> well, we don't have an Alexa, but like Richard said, our phones spy on us anyway. Right. And <laughs> they who do. Knows? And our TV has a microphone in it. I mean, we can ask it to do things we don't use that feature but it has the mic and mm -hmm. um, so yeah i anyway, guess what's next after that right what, they're... Th that's just it what's next and um i guess we'll find out right so it's just a matter of time well doctors have been trying for years to get people to take their medicine when they're supposed to that's always been a huge issue for doctors in the medical industry, so I don't know. <laughs> Maybe time for your medicine, <laughs> Mr. Jones. You, <laughs> right. You get to watch this TV show <laughs> until you take think. your medicine. I, could it come down to that? I mean, I really hope not. Anyway, it's time to get on to the program. Thank you, everyone, for your comments. And Brian Will is joining us. Hi, Brian. Thanks for joining Hi. us on the show. Hey, Richard and Elizabeth. How are you? Uh, we're doing great. And uh, so tell us about what you do and uh, how you help entrepreneurs. You know, my background over the last 30 years was launching companies that I've sold. Uh, I did two private, I won two venture capital exits and one private equity exit. Started consulting for, you know, public and Fortune 500 companies and sales and sales management. Trained people. We've driven billions of dollars in sales. Um, and I decided I wanted to take that back down to the entrepreneur level to what we call start up to $10 million in revenue. So I wrote the book, The Dropout Multimillionaire, which is 37 business lessons and how to succeed with no money, no education, and no clue, which was me, quite frankly, when I started. And uh, recently started another mastermind group, you know, working with young entrepreneurs. So my goal these days is see if I can help folks, right? So we, we, we like to say that 500,000 people a month start a business in this country. That's six million a year. That's what the Chamber of Commerce says. And we know that 70% of them will fail. That means four million people a year are going to start a business that fails. And I have found that they fail for a lot of the same reasons. And so my goal is to go out and try to help these folks not fail, not lose their life savings, not get themselves in trouble and cause undue stress. That's kind of the goal. Brian, so if I could just ask sort of a maybe a sensitive question here. Are, are you a dropout? Did you drop out from something? I actually failed out of high school. 
uh, my wow. junior year. And then I managed to get back in. I graduated with a 1.2 grade point average, which is like a D. <laughs> tried wow. to, I went into the military, tried to go to college, couldn't do it. And so I decided to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I would love to ask your net worth, but I don't think you should say it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, so, but I'm sure it's pretty high, right? So, um, so if that's really an unusual story. Uh, and uh, yeah, just for the record, my parents never graduated from high school either. So it doesn't, and they were successful. So I don't, mm -hmm. you know, education is not the only route, but I think you're the first person we've had on the show who's, who's uh, have ever had that path. What, wh why do you think it, it, school was such a challenge for you? I'm very ADHD. Of course, back in when I was in school in the late 70s and early 80s, we didn't know what that was, right? So I had a really hard time focusing. Unless I was super interested, I couldn't do it. I'd pick a book up and put it back down in, in three minutes. I, I, I just couldn't do it. So after a while, you just stop caring. And then you stop going to school. And then they say, hey, if you're not going to show up to school, you don't need to be here. And that's kind of where I was. Wow. Wow. Yeah, well, I, and that's really tough for people. I, it's better now. I agree with you. It's better now. My best friend was, I think she was dyslexic, but they didn't know that back then either, you know, mm -hmm. and she was smart. Like she was really street smart, but she just couldn't get good grades. She couldn't spell. And like you'd look and she'd write letters backwards and stuff, but nobody right. could figure out what to do with her. But, it, and I'm glad now that people have the help they need. It is amazing to me that you were able, you've been able to do everything that you can do, but it seems like with all the different companies you started, like you almost took that ADHD and said, okay, I'm just going to keep starting companies because that keeps me interested in going. And, yes. And that's in fact, as I like to say, I'm very good at the launch and build phase. I'm terrible at the management phase. So the companies that I've started, we got them off the ground, got them going, got them to an exit, but then somebody else took them and took them to the next level. So that's pretty much my track record. And that's, and, and that's kind of not untypical for people who have ADHD. They get very excited about solving the problem, but then once they've solved the problem, right, they're on to the next problem because they've solved it yep. and following through with the execution is, you know. I own a chain of restaurants I don't even go to. I don't know how to cook. Yeah. I don't know how to cook, don't know how to make drinks, don't know anything about running a restaurant. I own them and I let other people do it. Because well, once I, I built them, it wasn't that exciting. Yeah, I want to read your book. I hate to say this, but it, can I get it on Amazon? <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Alexa, can you please give us uh, Brian Will's book? Uh, it was uh, it was a Wall Street Journal and USA Today bestseller. It's been in the top ten in Amazon on every category for the last eighteen months. Yeah, you can get it there. And what is the name of your book? The Dropout Multimillionaire. Look at the screen there. It's right behind my head. Yeah, the Dropout well, Multimillionaire. People on the radio can't, can't see your screen, but. Um, but so how, I mean, how, just out of curiosity, I mean, we all have our strengths and our weaknesses, right? So how, I mean, and being in school, probably you realized fairly early was probably not a strength of yours, but how did you go about deciding to go into business based on the, the experiences that you had? So this goes back even a little farther. I grew up in, in, I'll, I'll say it nicely. We'll say a rough home, right? So, uh, I had to leave the house as soon as I graduated 18. So I was kicked out and I had no place else to go. I had a giant chip on my shoulder. I was a very angry young man, did the military. I was a national guard. Um, but when I got out, tried to hold a job and couldn't hold a job. Right. I got fired as a guy at little Caesars pizza. I got fired from a construction job. I got fired as a waiter. Um, and I just said, I, I hate working. I got to do something for myself. So I went to work for a landscaping company. And after a few weeks, I was like, Hey, Anybody can mow grass and dig holes. So I'm going to start my own business. So that's what I did. And we built that up to seven franchise units over the next eight years uh, before I got out of that. Actually, that one collapsed and burned. Learned a lot of lessons in that one. Mm. And then a buddy talked me into selling insurance because I didn't, in my mind, I didn't have any education or discernible skills. So I was really trying to do things that I thought didn't require those landscaping, selling insurance. And then what I found out when I started selling insurance, I was really, really good at sales. So that's a kinda, skill. That's a gift. And I don't know where it came from, right? So mm -hmm. I uh, I became the top agent in this agency within six weeks out of 15 people. I was producing 50% of the revenue. And that's when I was like, I'm just going to do this myself. This was the dawn of the internet. So I built the first call center in the country in 1999 for health insurance. And we were snapped up by an early dot-com venture capital company. 
I started learning about venture capital and how that worked. And it just, the, the acceleration just went, you know, from there. So wow. Kenya, do you have a, a question or, or a comment for Brian? I do. So they say all the C students fire all the A students. In life. <laughs> right? Well, I'm the D student. I don't know. Oh, what I, 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 was, I was the D slash F student. So I, I totally relate to you. We have very, a lot of similarities. Just question about like, you know, what you deemed at one point as a weakness in your life, right? And how you were able to identify those weaknesses and like leverage them to be an entrepreneur. If you could share that a little bit with our audience. Sure. My biggest weakness was an ego problem, which I find in 80% of entrepreneurs that are starting out unwilling to take advice, unwilling to trust other people, unwilling to let people do what they do best. And it took me honestly 15 years to get over that. So we struggled for a long, long, long time until I finally brought a partner in who I let mentor me. Um, and from there, I became a much better business person and we started making a lot, lot more money. That was great. Well, well what were the kinds of things that your mentor would do or say? What, what kind of advice did you get from from him. I'm assuming it's a him, but or her. Yes, it was my friend Steve. He actually just passed away recently. Uh, oh. That was a tough day, but uh, it was really just watching Steve interact with people. If you if you think about a person who's angry with a giant chip on their shoulder, as I say in my book, you know, if you're a hammer, everything's a nail. And, and I was a hammer. I, I was not a nice person. I was mean to my employees. I didn't treat people well. I was short. Um, and then when Steve came in, I watched how he dealt with people and how he managed them. And he had already been super uber successful in the past. And so it dawned on me that maybe it was me that was the problem. It was my attitude. It was my ego. It was me that needed to change. And so I allowed him to be the senior partner in this company. And I just basically followed behind him like, you know, a puppy just learning for a couple of years. And then we, we hit it pretty big. So, well, that must've you know. been hard, but it sounds like you did some soul searching and yes, I think that that's what we all need to do because we have our weak points and we don't want to acknowledge them, but we're forced to, right? Yeah, yep. I mean, and, the world keeps uh, teaching us lessons until we learn them, but right? I, one, one thing I wanted to ask you too was it sounds like you did a lot of different kinds of companies. Yeah. What was the one thing that tied it all together that made you so successful in so many different industries? Because obviously you didn't know these industries well. You hadn't grown up in them. You learned them as you were starting the company with them. So, so what was the one thing that led to the success? Would you say it, it, it was my ability to sell? It, that's why the landscaping company did well, and that's why the insurance agency that I launched did well. Is it it the ability to sell and teach people to sell? And and I I do believe at some level there are people that are just naturally we call them closers. Uh, yes, and I agree. the ability to sell means you can not only sell a product but you can sell a vision. And if you can sell a product and a vision, then you're probably a pretty good uh, candidate to be an entrepreneur. And that's what I was. So and you think people can learn that? To some I degree? think you can learn it to an extent. Sure. I, I have a training course we do where we teach them, you know, I call it the four keys to, to being a closer. Now, again, they've got to put their ego aside. They've got to be willing to learn. They've got to be willing to do the work. But sure, we've taken people from, you know, mid-level sales to high-level sales through training but there are some people who are just natural. And those are the, they're like, they're like, I always call it, you know, like the quarterbacks on the NFL team are special, right? You know, there are a lot of people that are, that are all American quarterbacks in college that you would think they're phenomenal, like Johnny Manziel. And he goes to the pros and he's not special, right? So there are people that are good, but they're not special. So there are people that are special in sales. And then there are people that are good and they can be trained up to be, you know, something really good. So different levels of salespeople, we call it. So, so, so you're working with on, entrepreneurs, this is sort of your universe now. What kind of advice now do you give to people who want to start their own com companies? We have a lot of listeners who, who like the idea of entrepreneurship. They're not sure if they're cut out for it mm -hmm. or, or, and they're thinking about maybe making the leap. What do you tell them? So this is going to be a little contrary. So, so bear with me for a second. When I talk to people who want to launch a business, to be very honest, and I do this in the book, I have a whole chapter in it, I will literally try to talk them out of it. And the reason I do that is because if you're going to launch a business, there's going to be a lot of stuff that's going to come at you, a lot of problems, a lot of issues, a lot of stuff that's going to break your heart, a lot of stress, a lot of time and energy and, and failures. 
And if you're not willing to go through that, you're not going to make it. And if I can talk you out of business, then you never should have started because you're not going to make it through all that mess. So if I can, if, if you, if and I tell people, I'm trying to talk you out of it. And if they get mad at me and they say, I want to do this, this is what I want to do. And I say, okay, we have a start. The second thing you need to do is you need to bring in a coach or a mentor unquestionably, because if you've never been successful in business, the truth is you don't know how to be successful in business. That's just the truth. And so you need to bring somebody in that has had success or knows the pitfalls you're about to go through, who can coach you and guide you and mentor you through those so that you don't have to make a thousand mistakes along the way. That is the very, very first thing you need to do. In fact, I, I tell young entrepreneurs this all the time, right? Apple Computer is run by Tim Cook. It's the largest company in America, probably the world, most profitable company in the world. Tim Cook has a board of directors. The board of directors come in every three to six months and they sit down with Tim Cook. Tim Cook tells them all their problems. They all give him advice. And at the end of the board meeting, Tim T Cook takes all their advice and he uses that advice to move Apple forward. Now, if Tim Cook's a pretty smart guy. If Tim Cook needs people to help him make decisions, what makes you as a young entrepreneur think you don't? I agree 100%. I am, as I said, have startups, but I have a coach, a business coach, and I have a peer advisory board that meets once a month with people that are really well-seasoned business people and it helps a tremendous amount and my coach is phenomenal I, I agree a hundred percent and I agree the desire the burning passion and desire has to be there do, what do you think about confidence because I feel like you have to be super confident that you can succeed does that matter I think that yeah it's part of the desire right again if I can talk you out of it then you weren't confident that you were going to be able to succeed it plays right into that if you're confident you can succeed, then you're going to tell me to pound sand. You're going to go build a business. That's what I want to hear from you. I, I want that confidence. That is, is great advice. We have to take a commercial break, but we'll be back with more Passage to Profit and Brian Will, who's our guest today. And uh, stay tuned. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back, listeners. You are listening to Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. We are interviewing an amazing serial entrepreneur who's telling a story that I've never heard before. And I, I just can't believe how much value we've already gotten. We're going to finish the interview with him and we're going to go to Kenya Gibson to ask the next question. Yeah. So I just want to talk about some of the pitfalls of business and what some of those are and how you help entrepreneurs get out of those ruts. There are a number of issues you're going to have as a young entrepreneur. I, I talked about one of them earlier and it's your ego. Okay. Entrepreneurs are driven. They're a personalities. They're red. They want to drive and push. One of the first things they'll have is an ego problem. The ego problem says that I know everything and I don't need your help. The second problem they generally have is they bring people in and they will not allow those people to learn what they need to do. They won't allow them to fail so they can become better. This, this is typical when you go see an organization and the, the CEO is running around doing everybody's job. And the argument they make is, well, I can just do it faster and it needs to get done. Well, if that's the way you're going to operate, then you're always going to be in burnout mode. You're always going to be working a thousand hours a week. You're never going to get an organization behind you that's going to be able to support you and grow and get you to where you needed to be. You don't start a business because you want to work a hundred hours a week and be stressed out and burned out. That's not why you start a business. And yet the ego will turn your business into that if you can't get it in check. And we're back to the coach. That's what the coach is going to help you do. I think that's great advice. And uh, as you mentioned, if you haven't, running a business is different than being in a business. And you have a lot of plates that are spinning at any given time. And you have to develop the ability to know which plate is starting to wobble and which one needs an attention and which one uh, is spinning fine and can spin fine for another few minutes, right? So yep. I, I sometimes talk with my clients and I tell them, you, you, you know, running a business, you have, you have to keep a lot of balls in the air at any one time. Uh, and you, over time, you, you begin to notice which ones are going to be uh, small problems, which ones could go from small problems to big problems. And then mm -hmm. sometimes you had just have big problems, right? Yep. And so, you know, and you, but you have to expect that you have to expect big problems. So, I mean, in my practice, we have big problems once every couple of uh, months, 
I, I'm sorry. Too, too, <laughs> maybe that was a little too honest. I will say, I was going to say, but once every six months, we have like a big process. Or it's all hands on deck. We've got to investigate this and we've all got right. to fix it. And we do. But it's just as part of the terrain. But I do want to say something. So I asked you about confidence, Brian. And the reason I did is because when Richards first started Gear Heart Law, he was able to land clients and he still does. And I believe that the reason he is so good at selling the jobs, landing the client, we don't really call it sales here. We call it landing clients is because he's been in the industry for a long time. And he speaks with such supreme confidence in his voice. You just know this guy knows what he's talking about, right? Well, th well thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it's true. And and do you think that's a part of sales is like really representing your product and knowing everything about it and being able to answer any question? Yes, as long as you can combine that with interpersonal skills, that people will make a connection with you. If you can take, if you can make that connection and you've got that confidence and, and you know what you're talking about, it's it's a foregone conclusion. Can you develop interpersonal skills if you don't have them? Sure, but I, I will tell you the funny thing is the the one interpersonal skill I tell salespeople all the time is shut up. <laughs> and Richard <laughs> says that to me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Just stop talking. Uh, well, wait a minute. Let's not take that too far. <laughs> you know, you're a genius until you start talking. Once you start talking, everything goes downhill. <laughs> <laughs> but, but honestly, he did say at the beginning. He said, look, when we're networking and everything, he said, what I'm finding when I'm talking to these people is they want me to hear them. They want to be heard. They just yes. want me to listen. Yes. Interpersonal skills, listening instead of talking. Yeah. And people will give you a, a, a clues about uh, themselves. And then if you can find a way to take that little clue and relate to it somehow, some yes. way, something in your life, then that's where the relationship begins. To build. They will close themselves. Absolutely. Yep. Okay, that's the deal. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to be sitting around in our living room and Alexa is going to be listening to us and we're going to keep ordering more and more from Amazon. Right. So, so you were a natural born salesman, but people can learn it. And I do, I do think the passion and the interpersonal skills are both super important. So if, and, and I think though, that we have blind spots, I don't know if I have good interpersonal skills. I know I have a lot of passion around what I'm doing, I don't know if I'm presenting it the right way. So I do think we need an outside person to tell us that. Well, I, I yep. find you extremely personable. <laughs> <laughs> you, you get my jokes. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I was joking around on my podcast, the other podcast, and she was like, well, you had to be there. <laughs> so, um, so what are some other guidelines? Uh, I mean, so the sales piece for sure. Uh, what other pieces um, need to go, what other tools do entrepreneurs need to be successful? Sure. I, I have a, another uh, speech. I actually just did this one for Molly Maid uh, down in Nashville. We call this time travel and your magic crystal ball, right? So I always, I tell business people, I say, listen, if I could, if I could take you into the future and show you what your business is going to look like in six months to a year, would that be helpful to you? And the answer is obviously yes. And I said, well, the truth is that's a magic crystal ball and you've already got it. And it's called your P&L, right? Mm -hmm. If we do a historical P&L analysis over a previous 24 months, oh, line minute, item by line item. Wait a minute, Brian. So a P&L, can you explain Profit and loss that statement. Profit Sorry, your profit and loss statement. statement. All your income sources, all your expenses. We break that down over 24 months. We look at every single line item and we do an analysis, what we call trends, right? Trend factoring. And if we trend factor that from 24 months to today, we can actually follow those trends pretty accurately into the future. And I can tell you what your business is going to do next year if nothing changes. And you may see specific line items in there that are going down and you have to make a decision on how to fix it. Or you may look at it and go, well, well hey, man, we, we're cranking. This thing's rolling. Okay, as long as you keep doing what you're doing, it's going to roll. <laughs> but you'd be surprised how many entrepreneurs, and I'm talking up to $5 million in revenue, don't run a P&L. They don't run a profit and loss statement. I find this in the restaurant business all the time when we go acquire these restaurants where they, they, they're like, well, we just throw the receipts in a shoebox and our accountant loads them up, you know, six months from now. If you don't know your numbers, there's no possible way you can run a business. So one of the biggest things between success and failure is knowing your numbers, having that time travel, having that magic crystal ball. That's a big one. So how do you pick the right person to do that work for you? Because I know we're not, not everybody's good at numbers and accounting, like 
we we have a very complex accounting system and you know people do like when you look at stuff accountants do it looks like greek sometimes mm -hmm. so how do you pick the right person because that's a sensitive area for business well i take i i honestly i take the we'll call them the the major factors the major um influencers in your business so i'll give you an example in a restaurant so if i pull my PL, my accountant my in-house accounting staff already knows that they're going to give me all my food costs, but then there's a percentage. All my liquor costs, but then there's a percentage. All my labor, but there's a percentage, right? So all I have to do at this point, because I've already broken the P&Ls down to the way I want to see them, I just look at percentage numbers. And if I can track them across time, then I can tell what's going on. I can literally look at a P&L and tell you what's going on in your business without ever stepping in it. What are so, the percentages? Percentages of what? Well, for instance, again, we'll go back to this restaurant. I know that food needs to be 32% of food sales. I know that liquor needs to be 22% of liquor sales. I know that labor needs to be 20% of gross sales. I know that rent needs to be 10% of gross sales. So if you track those four numbers and you've got your revenue line across the top, I can tell you what's going on in your business. If any of those numbers start to, to, to change or go down or go up, then we have to go in and figure out what it is. So after you've built the system, you don't have to look at everything all the time. You only have to look at the triggers. So uh, when you're uh, creating these uh, financial uh, documents, the, the, the numbers that you mentioned, is that kind of an industry standard or is yes. that more specific to the individual restaurant? It's going to be semi-industry standard. Some, you know, some restaurants are going to do different. If you're serving $100 steaks, you're probably going to have a higher food cost. You know, we serve $12 tacos. So yeah, you can break that down into a sales organization. I, I do this with, with uh, Fortune 500 companies. They've never seen anything like this. We call it bottom-up P&L. So we take your, each individual salesperson is an individual P&L within your organization. So we, we throw your OPEX costs into this, this, this individual. We throw their marketing costs into this individual. And then we track their results, their, their revenue. And we can tell you at an individual level how each salesperson in the organization is performing from a profit and loss statement. If you build the P&L from the bottom up, then the top down takes care of itself. But people tend to look at the top and they look at the big numbers and they think, oh, we're doing well. And I can't tell you a single organization I've gone into that I didn't fire 15 to 20% of the salespeople because they were, they were losing money. Right. It's hard though to find the software that does everything you want it to do. That's one thing we've always struggled with. And we think we have some software now that is going to give us the data that we need, but we actually are going to have our son do some programming for us to get the reports we need because we just can't, the software is not always where you need it to be for these kind of things. You find a lot of entrepreneurs that build their own. I built my own. So it does exactly what I want it to do. And that's, we're, we're going through the same process because uh, off, off the, off the shelf stuff does not really go into enough depth yeah. to really give you the kind of information that you're suggesting is necessary. So, yeah. Um, so uh, of all the uh, on businesses that you've started, wh what has been your favorite? You know, this is an odd question, but I, I'm not, I'm not emotionally involved in any business I've ever done. To me, business is what's fun. People say, well, you know, what are your hobbies? My hobbies are business. I just think it's fun. I think building something is fun and the industry to me doesn't really make a difference. They've all been different. They've all been fun. Learning so, something new has been fun. So I have a question for you that's going to be kind of a strange question. Let's go back to your high school days. If there had been a real life curriculum in your high school where you built a business and you decided to go, you had available the tools you needed to learn the things to build a business, do you think that would have made you stay in high school and helped you? You know, my answer to this is usually everyone has a journey. Mm -hmm. and I'm on my journey and I don't know that my journey could or would have changed if something else was out there. If you remember my high school days, I was a very angry young man. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if anything would have helped. Now I'm trying to work right now with a local high school and, and one of our local universities to talk to their entrepreneurship classes because they are severely lacking in what they offer these kids. Um, mm -hmm. So it'd be interesting to put some real talented people into classes like this and let them teach these kids and see what these kids could actually do. Cause they're actually motivated and interested and want to do things. I was not at the time. Okay. All yeah, I knew at the time was I wanted to be rich. That's all I cared about. <laughs> well, you got there. So congratulations. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> but I have felt that that might be one way to kind of revamp some of our educational processes in this country is to give kids skills. They feel they need for the real world. 
you know, because a lot of kids are like, I don't see why I'm taking this class. It doesn't, it, I'm never going to use this again. So, yeah, my daughter has an MBA and she still, when she got out of college, struggled to balance her checkbook. What's up with that? Yeah. Wow. wow. Well, wow. Uh, she knows how to do it theoretically. But... <laughs> well, our, our daughter, our daughter took a financial literacy class in like fifth grade and she's been a tight wad. Man, she manages her money down to the last penny. Like ever since <laughs> that class has been, made a huge impression. <laughs> So uh, one one question that it kind of came up, and that is, is, is should you rely on your own advice? So um, ah, that's a chapter in my book. Okay, that's a it's chapter in your book. It's called your personal filter. And should you listen to yourself? Right. And if you're new in business, and by the way, we break this down. And it, I'm not talking about being a parent. I'm not talking about raising kids. I'm not talking about any. I'm talking about business right now. If you are new in business, then you do not have the correct personal filter to make quality decisions. That doesn't mean you won't get lucky, but for the most part, you don't know what you're doing and you don't know how to make those decisions. And that is why you need to have a coach. Okay. Yeah, I agree. And, and other people maybe, I don't know, Richard gets a lot of advice from a lot of, <laughs> a lot of different people. <laughs> Which is great. I mean, you, you really, you do always want uh, as, 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 as many opinions as possible. You just have to kind of. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. As good as I think I am right now, right? When I wrote this book and I did the design for the cover and I sent it to the publicist and she called me, she goes, this sucks. We're not using this. And I was like, no, no, no. I am a businessman. I am successful. This is the cover we want to go with. And I argued with her for about 10 minutes. And then I wrote, I thought to myself, what am I doing? This woman has done like 200 book covers. I've done zero and I'm arguing with her. So I had to check my ego, let her do it. And it came out awesome. So it's, you know, everybody's got an ego. You still got to check it. Yeah. I had to find that out that my design skills aren't that great either. <laughs> I mean, I love Canva and doing all this stuff. People are like, uh, yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> yep. Well, that was an amazing comment. Thank you so much, Brian, uh, for injecting so much wisdom into our collective entrepreneurial minds. And we hope you'll stay with us for the rest of the show. Uh, and where can people find out more about you and uh, your, your information, your books, uh, seminars, uh, and all the other things that you're doing? Sure. It's www.brianwillmedia.com. Brianwillmedia.com. Everything's on there. That's great. Thanks a lot. We'll be right back right after this. Welcome back, everybody. It's Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt, our special guest today, Brian Will. Uh, and now it's on to Power Move. Hey, Kenya, what's on Power Move today? So for Power Move today, we have a little bit of a history lesson. We're going to give Power Move to... Maggie L. Walker, who is the first women-owned bank owner. So we were talking about entrepreneurship today with Brian on the podcast, or the radio show, rather, and I thought it would be interesting to highlight her because 100 years ago, she had founded Richmond, Virginia. I'm sorry. She had founded a Richmond, Virginia-based St. Luke Penny Savings Bank, and she became the first African-American to charter a bank and serve as a bank president. So she was an entrepreneur and a leader as well, and she helped the advancement of the economic uh, threshold for <laughs> communities of color. So I thought it would be great to highlight her and her work in that space. Well, uh, that is uh, amazing. And uh, does does it uh, is is the bank still around today? Do you know? That's or? a good question. Um, I'm not sure. It doesn't say it in this article. Um, but that's that's a great question. I I doesn't say it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't well, say. Alexa, is this bank still in existence? <laughs> well, no. Alexa, can you tell reporters to do the whole job <laughs> and not just part of a job? Um, so no, that's uh, that that's 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 great, and I, I I'm sure it took a lot of courage in those days to really a lot of drive, a lot of drive, a, a lot of entrepreneurism. Um, if you were an African American woman. Uh, to to do something like that, which was such a traditional white male uh, occupation. So mm -hmm. and uh, even a woman in general, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, right, absolutely. right. So congratulations. To so her. congratulations to her. And speaking of entrepreneurial women, it's Elizabeth, and she's going to talk to us about her projects. Yes. Yeah, so I have Blue Streak, which used to be Fireside, which is a video directory of business services online. It's B2B. 
And it's the first directory that is not location based because if you look at the all the websites and directories out there, at least when I looked a couple of years ago, when I started this, all of them were based on location. So this is based strictly on business services. It's strictly B2B. And you really, I don't, you don't want to have a location. I mean, you can put your location on there, but the location is not important. And I'm doing short videos and long videos of business owners to be in this listing directory. So uh, I do have, I just talked to my peer advisory board yesterday to Brian's point, going to make some more changes. I've changed this thing a number of times. I started in late 2019, right before COVID. I've changed it a whole bunch of times. I'm going to make some more changes talking to my web, doing a new website, talking to the website guy. We figured this, you know, so anyway, I'm listening to all these people that are much more experienced than me and are looking at this from the outside and incorporating a lot of the changes I suggest. That's one thing. And to my second thing is, this is kind of a long story. I'll try to make it really short. We got to- Yes, but tr try to make a long story short. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I would have made it shorter, but I ran out of time. <laughs> so we adopted a kitten that uh, developed this issue where he's scratching his face. So I started a podcast, found a podcast partner who's really into it. She's a lovely woman named Diane, Danielle. I always want to call her Diane, Danielle Woolley. Mm -hmm. And we have a podcast and we realized uh, getting some feedback and talking to people like you really can't talk about cats for 25 minutes. It's like <laughs> overkill. So we're I find that shocking because okay. I, you <laughs> routinely talk about cats for more than 25 minutes. I don't, it's hard to talk about a cat for more than 25 minutes. I'm sorry, try it. But anyway, so based on feedback, we're making well, maybe it, it just seems like 25 minutes. I don't know, but we're making it more about interesting people who like animals and cats in particular, but animals in general, because there are a lot of dog lovers out there that are interesting people too. And we even have and we know somebody who's a reptile lover who has snakes, who's a very interesting person. So anyway, we're, we're opening it now up. Now there's an interesting uh, challenge. Can you talk about snakes for 25 minutes? Absolutely. I guess so. Anyway, you can run away for 25 minutes, but on to the rest of the show. Because All right. We have some exciting things coming up. So I would like to introduce Taylor O'Neill with Richards Rainwater. It's richardsrainwater.com. And this is a very cool technology and very appropriate for the times that I'm just so excited about this. Taylor, please tell us what you're doing. Awesome. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, our company's journey actually started all the way back in 1994 when the Richard on our cans and our bottles uh, moved to Hill Country, Texas with his wife, Susie, and they were very frustrated with their choices in water. They didn't like the contamination of the city water. They didn't like the hardness of the well water. And so they installed a system to run their entire home on rainwater harvested water. And then the neighbors started coming over and noticed that the dishes were cleaner, the water tasted better, and started asking them a bunch of questions about what they had done and asking Richard to install the same system in their homes. And so he did that for about 20 years, installed thousands of home systems here in Texas for people who wanted a better source of water. Um, Richard and Susie are loving... Uh, lovingly hippies, for sure. Uh, the the exact type of people that you would think would would do something like this. And uh, Richard got to thinking on a job one day, what would it take for me to be able to bottle this and be able to give it to more more people? Um, it took him four years of back and forth with the TCQ, but in 2002, he became the first person in the United States to get approval for bottling rainwater. Um, and then as a hippie might, he spent 15 years caring a lot more about harvesting the rainwater um, than he did selling it. So uh, in 2017, myself and a few other folks got involved in the business. Richard and Susie were 70 years old and ready to, to do something else in, in, with the rest of their life. Uh, the bottling facility was hand built uh, by Richard himself. They had two filler heads missing. We were filling bottles one day and labeling them the next because we couldn't uh, get the labels on them in the same day. They had three people working three days a week. Um, they sold to some of the coolest people in Austin, some famous folks that everybody listening to the show would know and some of the best hospitality venues in Texas, but didn't care so much about uh, uh, anything other than the, the fact that the customers had to share their sort of vision of what was important in the world and 
uh, focus on sustainability, focus on higher quality products. Um, and so we were brought in um, because one of our largest shareholders has given a lot of money to clean water initiatives all over the world and was very intrigued by the concept that Richard had put together with Susie and, and had a different perspective on it um, because he'd been to places like Africa where um, folks that he was helping didn't have access, immediate access to clean water. Um, so year one, I went from being a, a recovering hedge fund uh, guy to a water salesman um, with uh, <laughs> less training than the folks that Brian has helped. Um, but we sold it to quite a lot more locations here in Austin and got our first uh, distribution contracts. And um, we're kind of on the way to proving that other people shared some of our thinking about water being more important than the average person in this country cares to cares to think about. Um, so my, my, my first question is, yeah, how, how does rainwater taste? Does it taste different from tap water or bottled water? Other it does. Yeah. It's one of the most common pieces of feedback for us is uh, we get a lot of people who say water tastes like water and we just say, here, just, just try it. You know um, it's cleaner and we can prove that. So um, it, it absolutely tastes different. And uh, it's one of the, the major selling points in terms of consumer um, adoption is just the way that it tastes. It's, it's a lot be better. It doesn't have that little chlorine tang. <laughs> so, <laughs> Alexa, take out of the chlorine out of my water. No, um, so the 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 taste is different. How would you? I, well, well, what is in bottled water compared to rainwater? Why are they different? Sure, it gets down to the very very minutia of the total dissolved solids and the bacterial makeup of the different waters, and then. Um, also the treatment mechanism. So um, we harvest the rainwater right at the collection sites that, that we're working with. 100% um, uh, of our water that goes through the treatment system that we've proprietarily designed uh, ends up uh, able to go into a bottle or a can, um, but we don't use any chlorine in our process. And so the, the very, very minutia of the makeup of the water just has less stuff in it is the sort of common sense way to describe it. And that ends up making it taste cleaner. Some people say it tastes sweet. Um, it's just a, a softer, much better uh, mouthfeel than the other waters that are out there on the market. Yeah, I told you about this before we started, but I have to bring it up. When I was a little kid, I think I had read some, like, something like Titanic where they were on this ship and then they went out and they got this clean water on the top of the ship and it tasted so good. So I decided I was going to try that. So I put a little cup outside and got some rainwater in Seattle. So like it was easy to do. Um, and there was all sorts of stuff floating in it, like little black pieces. And it didn't taste very good. Really? Even yeah. Seattle rainwater was yeah. impure? I, and it rains a lot there. But yeah, there, there, I mean, we lived in the city of Seattle. So of course there was like the smog components and stuff. But you have a method for getting that kind of stuff out of there, right? Yeah, so just remember that the rain cycle is exactly the thing that you learned in fifth grade. All the water on this planet has been around since the beginning of time. And so we're just recycling the water that has always existed, right? And so it's just a matter of where are you capturing in that cycle and how has it had a chance to absorb contaminants? Water is a universal solvent. It wants to absorb everything that it touches. And it's actually a naturally cleansing event in the atmosphere. So if you're in a very, very clean place, the rain straight away is going to be exceptionally clean, but it's also going to you know, flush anything out of the sky and anything off the collection surface. And so we have a sensor in our system that knows when it starts to rain. And today we don't collect the first 0.2 inches of the rain event. It goes directly through the natural stormwater management system at the, at the sites where we're, we're partnered. And then from there, 100% of the water ends up in a tank, and then we treat it with a zero waste chlorine free process. And from there, 100% of the water ends up in a can or a bottle. So you can think of this like the solar power of water, it's renewable, we're going to get it scored as a water credit, sort of like a carbon credit, because it's actually water positive relative to the amount of potable water that that same raindrop would produce if it were left to run into the retention pond or the runoff um, location from the building. And so, um, 
Yeah, we've showed that uh, after Mother Nature does her natural uh, cleansing, the water is exceptionally clean, which is great news for us because, again, all water in this world starts as rain or another form of precipitation. So if the going in principle is that the rain is dirty, we've got a real problem because the water gets dirtier and dirtier and dirtier as it goes through groundwater, uh, you know, ground contamination and has a chance to pick up other other sources of things that we we don't want to consume. I mean, it's kind of surprising. I always just I, I kind of just thought off the top of my head that rainwater would be like the purest water there is, but it's only as clean as the sky it falls through, right? So, well, like acid rain, yeah. Yeah. So, but well, I know Brian, do you have a question or comment? Yeah. So I I'm looking on Amazon. I see your product out there. Mm -hmm. So you guys have obviously launched and you're rolling along. And your facilities are are where did you say they were? So we have one in Kiln, Mississippi at a brewery. We, we just launched what we think is the world's largest potable rainwater facility in New Orleans uh, at another brewery. And then we're talking to facilities in North Carolina and Oregon and Florida and Pennsylvania. So um, our plan is to build a decentralized network of these collection sites so we can move the water the least possible distance from where it's captured to where it's consumed. Because when you think about bottled water and water in general, you know, the first and most important thing is the cleanliness of the product. Uh, the second thing in terms of environmental impact of moving something as heavy as water is how far does it travel in and what mechanism does it travel in, um, in terms of the carbon footprint reality of, uh, uh, of the impact that the business is putting on the planet. So do you have this product on the shelf or is it online sales at the moment? No, yeah. So uh, we we're sold nationwide at Whole Foods. We're in other banners like uh, H E B, Central Market, Kroger, Sprouts, um, Albertsons. So uh, building a national network of retail partnerships, and then again, um, our business was really built like has its foundation serving hospitality, but venues, bars, restaurants, coffee shops. Right. So Brian, I'd love to. We'd love to get the product sold into your restaurants. You know, well, I was just, I was, I <laughs> yeah. was just thinking, what kind of output? Uh, do you have right now potential? I, I assume since you're looking at more locations, you're trying to crank that up. Yeah, we are for sure. And um, so at every site, we go in and do a 10 year analysis of every rain event that's taken place in that geography. And we use that to assess the probability of drought. And and what that that input allows us to figure out how much storage tank do we need based on the amount of production that the site is trying to produce. Uh, oh, and the probability. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, so Kenya needs Kenya, to. Do you, do, you, uh, do you have a question or a comment? I do. I mean, obviously, water continues to be this like high commodity. And do you see like your technology and your process like kind of be, becoming like the national or the global footprint for how we start to preserve our water and, you know, continue to live on from here? Because it's it's scary what's going on with the water right now. I, it's a great comment. It's the reason we're excited about our business. Um, you know, in the years that I've been running Richards, five years, we've had at least a few days every year in Austin, Texas, where the municipal water system wasn't producing safe water. That's one example. Then you think about things like Flint, Michigan and Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, then you move over to California where we've had extreme drought. Then we get extreme weather. And instead of being able to harness that rain when it when it fell, it ran off and actually created uh, additional contamination of the, the waterways that um, folks are trying to access on a normal basis. So we think that what we're doing is the leading consumer facing example of a concept that should be proliferated in different ways. Big buildings should harvest rainwater and use it for um, you know their, their water sources. We think sports stadiums, malls. Uh, this is one of the only ways to take better care of the water that's falling from the sky and use it more efficiently so we can put less pressure on the existing infrastructure, which quite clearly needs to be updated and invested in in a real significant way, even in our country. And it's light years better here than it is in certain other places in the world. So it's a basic concept in a lot of ways, just takes people caring enough to go out and systemically install these things um, and we're excited about, you know, the current products being a way to talk to people and consumers and raise these issues and demonstrate, you know, a solution that in its foundation is pretty basic, just 
people to care enough to do something well, that's about that's a great i mean i think it's a great, great vision i just wonder could i get one for my own personal property and do it myself you can uh for sure it's actually easier from a regulatory standpoint to do it um on your own property so every state regulates water differently there's a national policy through the epa but every state has their own epa uh, organization and, and their own FDA organization. So we're in the process. We have approvals um, in Texas, in Mississippi, in Louisiana. We just got conditional approval in Florida, North Carolina, Alabama, and Georgia. Uh, there's a We have an approval in Oregon, uh, but we're systemically going through the states where it rains the most and aligning that around our sales strategy to try to put these sites in the places that are going to be the most beneficial and really introducing the concept to regulators from a, a commercial standpoint. So what are the, like the, the, like major uses for Richard's water? I mean, obviously it's, it's drinkable. Um, do uh, restaurants cook with it? Um, is it used in other ways? Uh, probably not for bathing, but it's mostly, just consumed in some way, right? Yeah. So for for us today, our products we have uh, we put our our still water in aluminum cans. We're one of the first companies to eliminate the single use plastics. Uh, our sparkling water is in a glass bottle. The bubbles stay carbonated over twenty four hours. So we do see a lot of bars, restaurants, and consumers using it in mixology, whether it be mocktails during dry January or cocktails. Uh, we serve a lot of. Uh, sparkling rainwater with tequila and a lot of sparkling rainwater with whiskey. It makes a really, really good mixer because the water is actually cleaner than the other types of water that it could be mixing with these really nice um, spirit brands. So it lets the spirit taste sort of come through in a in a better way. Um, and then Richard does always uh, tell stories about, uh, you know, showering in his rainwater systems at home. And that was when he really knew uh, how much better the water was, but I don't think many people are pouring out our cans and taking a, a home shower with it these days. Well, but you've deliberately decided not to use plastic bottles to deliver the water. So it's either glass or uh, aluminum. It's a premium product then, right? Yep. I mean, in terms of expense. Uh, we we would call it like approachably premium, um, you know, so in the water shelf, uh, when you think about bottled water and sparkling water, there's thousands of competitors, but they can really be broken down into one of two things. It's municipal water with fancy branding or maybe some flavor, uh, but just the same water that comes out of your tap or it's bottled at the source. Think something like Fiji or Evian. Uh, the problem with those waters is they are sending water in a container from a single point on the earth all over the rest of the planet. And the carbon footprint associated with moving water from Fiji to New York is really criminal. It makes no sense. It's, you know, really insane. So we're trying to combine a bottle at the source quality water that can be found in lots of locations and build, again, something that looks in many ways like the solar power of the water market. That's excellent. I think that's really one of your top selling points. But unfortunately, we can't discuss this anymore right now. But people can find you at richardsrainwater.com, right? And richardsrainwater.com, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, um, all the all the good places of social media. And and people can look for it in a wide variety of uh, retail outlets. Can they also order over the internet or? You can order it on our website, um, launched Amazon very recently. So that's just a new initiative, but um, lots of places to find it. And we'd certainly appreciate people giving it a try and telling well, us I'm what thirsty. they think about I the wish taste. I had a glass of it right Alexa, now. Get me some really clean water get to me drink. Some Richard's <laughs> rainwater. <laughs> well, that was excellent. Thank you. So now we're going to be talking to Steve Graham with Valiant Coaching. So I know we have two coaches on the program, but their coaching strategies are very different. Brian helps with bigger companies. Steve helps more with individuals and really interested to hear what you're doing, Steve. Welcome to the well, show. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both for, for having me uh, on today. And, you know, uh, a lot of what Brian is talking about is, is foundational to what I do as well. And Many times it could be a collaborative uh, process where I'm working with an individual as their coach, but they may have a business coach that's working on larger, more organizational type skills. And the key there is to have alignment because we all know that 
leadership creates the cultural DNA. It does go downhill from there. So if there's alignment between what I'm working on as their independent professional coach and maybe what Brian's working on organizational, the the the, the uh, chances of having our desired outcomes and, and success go way up. So I launched Valiant Coaching and Talent Development in 2015. I'm based in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, but because most coaching is done virtual, I have clients all over the globe. I work from everywhere from college graduates to Fortune 100 uh, CEOs and, and other C-suite level individuals. Uh, and, and at the heart of it is really helping them find what's inside and helping them uh, find solutions to break down assumptions, to challenge imposter syndrome, all of those things that go along with being either a new leader or on the career side, hey, I'm out of college now, what do I do? Or I've been with the same company 30 years, I don't like it anymore, what do I do? And I really focus on both career and leadership coaching. That's interesting. So what kinds of things uh, do you say to somebody who says, well, I, I, I would like to improve my leadership? What kind of directions do you take them? Well, you know, with coaching, it's all about listening. So, you know, I'm, I'm unlike an advisor or consultant, I'm not giving them the exact play cards and roadmap. I'm walking alongside them, maybe challenging a lot of the assumptions that they had that are creating these barriers. If it is an environment where I have experience, then I'll take off the coaching hat and put on a mentor hat and go into more detail and kind of connect the two. But you know, I start every session with what do you want to get out of today? What do you want the what do you want to accomplish with our time together? Because it's their time and they're driving the agenda. And so really it's doing a lot of that active listening, helping maybe build some more self-awareness, challenging assumptions. You know, we talked about the voices we have inside. Those are good, but they can also be bad because if we listen to too much of the bad, it can throw us into that imposter syndrome or really not allow us to be who we need to be. And to Brian's point, when I work with entrepreneurs, I, I see that day one, they're highly ego driven. They, they don't really want answers from me, but they do want to be heard. And that's what good coaches do. We listen and we walk alongside of our clients. So are you a coach or a therapist? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm a coach. But you know that you bring up a great question because even in coach training, you know, it is one of the helping professions, you know, training, mentoring, coaching, counseling. The biggest difference in counseling and coaching, counselors are mental health trained professionals. They're licensed and they deal with everything in the past. They go way back to, you know, I had a bad childhood. Now that's affecting me as an adult coaches we work today going forward and I do have certain clients that are both working with a counselor and me as a coach I had a, a young man a number of years ago that did not have a very supportive mother so no matter how many uh, attributes promotions he got she just wasn't interested she said you'll never amount to anything so he's got this voice in this ear these accolades in the other he needed counseling but my part was to take where he is today and keep helping them move that forward. So they often can work in concert together. Well, that's very uh, inspiring. Is that a common uh, voice that uh, that people, is, is that a common statement for people that you're never going to amount to anything? Do a lot of people yeah. have that that kind of- I uh, see Brian nodding. Challenge, yeah. you know, uh, that, that you message know, in their head? A, a lot can. You know, and it all depends on a lot of their upbringing. You know, we're all products of so many things. So I, I tell new leaders, you're probably picked up your management playbook from that leader. And if it was a terrible leader, unless you were just so turned off by it that you said, I'm not going to be that type of leader, you're going to pick up a lot of bad habits from that leader and continue that DNA, so to speak, with your people. Well, that's the way I was treated, and that's the way I'm going to treat you. That's not how everybody does it, but certainly there are a lot of factors there. Well, you know, I just had an insight listening to you about myself that I never had before. And that is one of the reasons I went out on my own was because I had worked with bad leaders, people mm -hmm. who, who didn't treat me with, you know, didn't, weren't fair or weren't honest. 
or just had abrasive characteristics, right? And so being in that environment, I wanted to escape uh, professionally. And eventually that's, that's what, that's what happened. And, but I mean, it's, it's very interesting. What you just said is you're a product of your environment. And a lot yeah. of people become entrepreneurs because they don't like the environment that they're in. Well, I worked with a, a gentleman, uh, you know, he graduated vet school. This was before the concept of mobile, mobile vets and the conveniences of having your pets treated in the comfort of home was really that widespread. He'd gone to work with a group of much older vets. There was a big generational difference. And with that, a difference in work ethic and how things get done and just really treated him very poorly. So at the end, he really wanted to start his own business. But he had this image of an entrepreneur means I've got to be this, this, and this. But that wasn't the case. But it was deprogramming him to say, Where, where's that coming from? Why are, you know, challenging those assumptions. And once we broke all that down, he had the courage to go out and start his own vet practice. And today he's been in it 15, 16 years and very successful. That's great. Yeah, I see Kenya looks like she has a comment or question. I was just curious, can you deprogram a toxic leader? Like, is that possible? Uh, well, they have to. <laughs> you mean, you know, deprogram <laughs> from your head or from their head? From their head. Well, <laughs> I can't personally do it. I don't mean, but, you know, but. Uh, that has to come from within. First of all, they have to have enough self-awareness mm -hmm. to see that they are a toxic leader. They're, they're going to fight you. Uh, whenever I've had to do 360s for clients, nobody wants to see the 360s. I and mean, I had one CEO that was more interested in who said that than what we're actually seeing the person saying about them. And we kept coming back to, you're not going to ever know who this person is, but you need to focus on these comments. This is what we need to focus on. So you know, they have to become self-aware. We all have blind spots. And I think if there is that realization, I've had leaders look at their 360s and say, you know, I really do need to make a change, but they have to drive the change. Yeah, that's tough. Brian, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, I'll emphasize a couple of things that Steve said. Number one, um, the biggest reason you can't detoxify a leader is if that leader is having some success because they believe that tax, that toxicity is what's driving yeah, to that success. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example. I was brought in to consult for a company in Portland, Oregon, and the CEO of this company had been trained by a billionaire out of New York. And he was a grenade thrower and he would walk into meetings and yell and scream. And, yeah. and I, he brought me in and asked me if I would help him. And I said, I'm, I'll do it under one condition. You are no longer in charge of this company. You do not get to make decisions. They're all me. So your only choice is to fire me or let me do my job. Fortunately, he decided to let me do my job, but uh, it, he was super toxic. Um, but let me ask you this. I do want to focus on one thing you said. You said it so lightly that I want, to, I want you to, to reemphasize it. You said sometimes you take your coach hat off and put your mentor hat on. Right. Explain the difference. So mainly with the mentoring, that's someone who's usually in a higher position or more experience, and I can give exact advice about Hey, I spent years in sales. So if I'm coaching a sales leader, I can work with, hey, I, I, I've been down that road before. I can do this and that. Where in the true coaching vein, I may be limited on giving more of the specific information, but challenging the person I'm coaching to find the solution themselves. Okay, why do you think this? What's going on there? Tell me about a time that you did this. Trying to keep all the questions open-ended. Uh, that's the really big difference, but many times... In fact, when I was starting coaching Brian, many of my clients were people that I had managed. So they only knew me from that advising role, that mentoring role. And when I started asking all these open-ended questions, like, why aren't you giving me these answers? What's wrong with you? Are you on some kind of medication? I'm like, no, but you always give me the answers. I'm not giving you the answers right now. You have the answers. So it took a while for me to even get used to doing that. And if you talk to a lot of my coaching peers that came through my training, we all went through the same thing because that's usually where the first bulk of clients come from are people that have known us from some other experience and we would manage them, advise them. So it's perfectly fine if I'm sitting in a room and it's a true coaching session, but I've, I've got expertise in an area to say, I'm going to take off this hat and I'm going to put this hat on and then kind of bring it all together. So coaching is guiding, mentoring is this is exactly what you need to do. Yeah, this is what you need to do. It's more leading, giving okay. advice, 
where I coaching is like, you. you you tell me that. Yeah. Yeah, I gotta ask you, Steve. When they asked you, are you on medication? Why didn't you say like, no, I quit my corporate job. I'm off all my meds. Right. <laughs> or it depends on the medication we're talking about. So we need to qualify what the medication is. Probably was on some type of medication, but nothing that would have impacted the coaching session. We're all on medication. <laughs> Although I don't I'm addicted you, to aspirin. Yeah. Tripp Taylor's going to go off some medication. Right? I, you know. I, can you do you have another thought or comment no i actually brian stole my thunder that was my question no. but oh. it's all good <laughs> you know i'll, I'll sorry I'll this when, when i when i started coaching so the industry wasn't new but um it was still in a growing phase today there's more acceptance by you know hr organizations different types of organizations that do training and development because it is one of the helping professions. Some organizations even hire internal coaches. I think you'll see most of us be external to an organization because we don't bring any biases in. And I don't have to know who all these other characters are to come in. And sometimes it's actually better if I don't. That way I'm not tainted or biased. And I think oftentimes it helps build more trust with the client if I'm if they're paying me rather than oh, the company's paying me to get a coach. And we've, we've had to shift the thought that coaching is punitive. Coaching is developmental. It is not punitive. In fact, there are some organizations that are adding, we'll give you X number of coaching hours as one of their total reward perks in the company. We know coaching helps people. All of us have tough times. We just need someone that can listen to us. Well, and really successful, rich people have coaches. It, it's not just people that are starting businesses. Like, I think there are a lot of people that have coaches or just somebody on the outside that could bounce things off. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, we have to conclude this segment, but we're not done with the show yet. So Steve, where, do, how do people find you? I'm at uh, www.valiantcoaching.com. Excellent. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. You're listening to Passage to Profit, Road to Entrepreneurship with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart and our special guest today, Brian Will. If you missed any of the show, the podcast will be out tomorrow. And I got to tell you, if you've never heard Brian Will speak, you need to hear what he had to say because it was amazing. And everybody else on the show has been amazing. I was too. just going to say, we've had a lot of amazing content today and uh, definitely check out our podcast. So we'll be right back. And welcome back, everybody. Passage to Profit. I think we're having almost as much fun during the breaks as we are uh, <laughs> during the program itself. But that said, it's now time for Elizabeth's famous. It's the end of the show question question. Okay. So, Brian, well, this goes to you first. All right. Which animal do you think would make the best entrepreneur? All right. So the quick, quick background here. An entrepreneur needs to be at 30,000 feet managing multiple divisions, multiple ideas, multiple projects. He needs to be up there so he can look down on everything. Perfect animal for that is a giraffe. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And also kind of on the flashy side too. I like that part. Uh, Taylor O'Neill, which animal would make the best entrepreneur? It's a great question. Um, Unfortunately, my dog got hurt yesterday, so the only animal I could think about is him right now. I think he does uh, exhibit or exhibit some some traits that are helpful. Um, he he's very empathetic to the whole family, and I think that's an incredibly important trait. Uh, the higher that you get in your organization, trying to relate to all the different folks, he's incredibly positive, and uh, I think that's something that's one of the most difficult things that I've had to remind myself of along the way for all the challenges that Brian brought up during his, his talk. Um, they do seem never ending at times, but it's a are on the right trajectory. It's important to remember all the positive things that are happening and remind your team of all the positive things that are happening uh, while you're moving them along to the next things that have to get done. Excellent. Yeah. So Steve Graham, which animal would make the best entrepreneur? Well, I'm, I'm a dog person, but I've got to tell you, I really did some thinking about this. I, I think it would be a cat because cats stay curious no matter what. 
cats are not really dependent. Hey, take it or leave it. You know, you can love me. You can aim me, whatever. They will show you affection, but it's going to be on their time. Um, I think you have to have a lot of that resilience when you're an entrepreneur, like Brian was talking about, almost talking you out of doing it. You know, and a cat does what a cat does and, and goes about their way. So <laughs> I, I think it would be a cat. Okay. That's a pretty good answer. Yeah. Ken, Kenya? Kenya Gibson, yes. Well, what animal makes the best entrepreneur? I would have to say a lion. So it's similar in the cat family, right? Lions are very courageous. They're very tenacious, right? They, they're they very focused in terms of like what they have on their radar in terms of like a goal or a target. And they'll bite your head off if they need to, right? <laughs> Which I think are all keys to a great entrepreneur, right? <laughs> Which one is Gearheart? Which oh, wow. will make the there, best entrepreneur? There are, are so many possibilities here, but I'm going to go with one that's not obvious. And that is a turtle. Okay. Because a turtle is almost indestructible, and if it comes under attack, it just kind of hunkers down, it waits for the attack to pass, and then it gets up, and it starts plodding along slowly and carefully, and they also live a long time, and they don't eat a lot. So I think that those <laughs> are all good characteristics for an entrepreneur. <laughs> well, the... You don't have to, sp there may be times you go hungry as an entrepreneur. Let me just put it that way. So, well, so I was thinking a dog because they are resilient. No, nothing seems to bother them for very long, but I changed my mind, but this dog was already taken. So I was really thinking that about, I think I'm yeah. the toes thinking there. You managed to switch animals <laughs> in mid show. <laughs> I'm going to say an ant. And the reason I'm going to say an ant was, was I think they can carry like a hundred times their own weight or something like they're incredibly strong creatures and they all know how to get along with each other too. So, and they can climb up walls <laughs> and, and, and annoy walls. people <laughs> and they can find food. <laughs> they, they need to. So, so there we have it folks. So to wrap up, Richard has kindly reminded me that I do need to go through everybody's websites again. Mm -hmm. So who was on the show today? Marvelous Brian Will, serial entrepreneur, business management consultant, and best-selling author, brianwellmedia.com. And his book is The Dropout Multimillionaire. And so no matter where you started, you can finish big. And I think Brian is a great example of that. And then we had an incredible innovation for water with Taylor O'Neill, richardsrainwater.com, probably the cleanest best tasting water you'll ever drink i hope his business never goes underwater <laughs> oh god please <laughs> amazing steve graham with valiant coaching i really love his approach to coaching and mentoring uh i thought he really is yeah i mean very personable and approachable i think that's and that's a wonderful characteristic Thank i you. think for somebody who's Who's a who's a coach? Yeah, he just feels like somebody you could really trust, like you could talk to him and and really trust what he's saying. And that's valiantcoaching.com. That's great. So um that said, it's time for us to wrap things up. Uh we need to sign off this week, but we will return to this station next week with another episode of Passage to Profit. And before we go, I'd like to thank the Passage to Profit team, Noah Fleischman, our producer, and Alicia Morrissey, our program director. And the whole iHeart team. Our podcast can be found tomorrow anywhere you find your podcast. Just look for the Passage to Profit show. And don't forget to like us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And remember, while the information provided during this program is believed to be correct, never take a legal step without first checking with your legal professional. That's it for us. And we'll see you next week on Passage to Profit.